All right, what is going on? Um, we are here with Edward Trois on the Strength Method podcast, uh, and I, I'm going to let Edward kind of give a little intro and bio and autobiography um, of himself, because I'm also interested. We started talking a little bit already, and I'm like, all right, we should just start recording <laughs> because we're going to have to go over this again. So, um, but for a little bit of context, um, you know, again, like we're always talking about social media is this social media is that I always want to share the perspective. Like, man, I get, I run into so many wonderful people sh sharing wonderful information on the internet. Um, and, uh, Edwards one was one of those. I saw your, um, your recent uh, rope flow video and how it affects the brain, which that one kind of blew up. Um, and so that's how I found out about you, started looking through your page. So um, yeah, man, give it, it's, a, it's a pleasure having you here and uh, give a little uh, autobiography. Yeah, well, thank you, Rambeer. I appreciate you offering the opportunity for me to come on to your podcast. It's, it's a weird thing, the internet, but it's a great thing. That's, that's for sure. And, and having situations like this pop up are, are always fun and, and a good time. So I'm really happy to be here. So uh, the short kind of synopsis of how I got to where I'm at now, uh, as long of a story as it is, I'll, I'll make it short and concise. But uh, I grew up on Long Island and I grew up overweight and essentially pre-diabetic. I, I had no idea at the time that I was actually pre-diabetic, but after I got a little bit more educated into my later teen years and early 20s, having been able to look back at what I was experiencing, I realized I was actually very unhealthy. And so as a lot of us guys get into fitness, it was uh, along the lines of having my first breakup where I was miserable for weeks and weeks and weeks. And my mom just looked at me and she's like, go for a run. Just like enough of this, go for a run. And so I can remember going on that run. I, I might've got like three quarters of a mile into it. And it was a very profound moment for me. I think a lot of us live very habitually and in our subconscious for a good chunk of our lives, if not the most part of our lives. So having that first kind of awakening moment to being able to control and realize you have this ability to manipulate your life is really powerful. And so I had it at a very young age at the age of just 14, where on that run, uh, something just happened and I actually stopped running, but it was like I... I was living in my body for the first time, it seemed like, where I had this kind of ability to feel like, oh, wow, like I can control my emotions. I can control my body. I can control my moods a little bit. And I got hooked. And so basically from that night on, you know, I cut out all fast food. I started cooking for myself. I, I stopped drinking soda. And I was the pioneer in my family, in a sense, toward uh, a healthier lifestyle. And, you know, I was cooking for myself, I was eating more protein and just had available to me very rudimentary sources of information. So I started doing something like an intermittent fasting type idea where like I would stop eating at a certain point, but I was really starving myself because I was running so much and I was so young and still growing. So yeah. um, I dropped all that weight. And then realized, okay, I'm like starving myself and I'm, now I'm a twig. I'm like 115 or 125 pounds or whatever. And then I saw some bodybuilders online. I think it might have been on YouTube or something. I started looking up fitness stuff and it was like Greg Plitt and, and all those other guys that were kind of in like the early, early 2000s. Yeah, the early 2000s where YouTube was really starting to kind of catch its... Uh, it's flow with content, I suppose, and, and really becoming a, a source of information. And so I, I think I was 15 that, that lasted about a year of just the running and losing weight and just, uh, and, and of course all those symptoms that I had been experiencing, which was, um, like I had gym class first period, for example, my freshman year, and I would have something like a 400 gram of carb breakfast with like Aunt Jemima yeah. pancakes and, and orange juice and all this, which of course was not real orange juice. Yeah. <laughs> um, but nonetheless, all those things went away, you know? And so I got into lifting and I was playing ice hockey at the time as well. 
so I always kind of had like an athletic background, but I wasn't necessarily the best ice hockey player. And so I knew that wasn't going to be my future. And because bodybuilding is such an individual thing where you tangibly can really see what you get out of what you put into it. Yeah. I just became, I became obsessed. Like I was the school bodybuilder basically. Um, there were, there were guys bigger than me, but there was no one training like me. That's, yeah. that's for sure. Um, so that became equally as detrimental to my health and life by time I was 21. So from the age 16, 15, 16, to 19 my goal was to get on stage at one point like maybe in my 20s i was thinking and so that turned into a contest prep at the age of 19 now on top of this i'm accumulating a whole bunch of injuries from ice hockey and still training cuz conventional bodybuilding and any sort of sport do not mix they just they train the nervous systems in such different ways that you're going to get hurt doing one or the other if if you're doing too much of either yeah and I was doing so much bodybuilding that ice hockey was just, um, you know, something my dad was forcing me to do, but loved it having looked back at it and, and yeah. whatnot. So I'll digress though. So um, two weeks out from that first competition, like a punk 19 year old, I tried to hit a deadlift PR <laughs> and, <laughs> and I'm using those wrist straps, right. To help yeah. my grip. Cause I know how weak I am and how lean I am. And so I managed to hit this PR. I hit a 400 pound deadlift at a body weight of like 138 pounds or something. Jesus. And and I went for a celebration let like I went to go throw it down cuz I was like yeah, yeah, you know. And uh, one of the straps got stuck. And so oh, my left hand released, my right hand got caught, and so I got pulled down with the bar and what wound up happening was I dropped that barbell, that 400 pound barbell on my left quadriceps oh. right at the tendon right, right at the, the rec, rec femme tendon. Yeah. And so, um, interesting story that I'll kind of revert back to, uh, after, but go to the hospital, get diagnosed. They're just like, ah, it's just a, a muscle contusion. Like it's just a bruise, like no yeah. MRI necessary. Go home. Here's some painkillers. Yeah. Miserable because at that point bodybuilding was my identity. And so I, I was crushed. I had no idea who I was. I knew I couldn't train the way I was. Uh, I knew that, um, an, an injury like this not only messes with your physique, but your performance for potentially months or years or, or my lifetime. Like these guys were like, yeah, just get used to walking weird. Like, don't worry about it. Deal with it. And so, uh, that kind of put me inside of myself for the first time where I was thinking about who I was and what I was doing. Yeah. And, um, sure. I, I couldn't let go of the bodybuilding though. And so I started actually, um, I would say within six months, I did my first cycle of steroids after that injury oh, because so I was, tr I was, tr I was trying so hard to grip onto what I was. Yeah. So I thought that was going to be a way that I could heal it faster and be able to do what I really wanted to do. Um, so I gained 30 pounds, which I had already gained back all that fat and everything that I had lost for the contest prep, just from not training and like binge eating. Cause I was so depressed. Um, so at the end of that year, I went from 135 pounds, dieted down, got the injury, healed for a few months, got on steroids. And then three months after that, I was 198 pounds. Jesus Christ. So in, in one year, I cumulatively lost and gained like about a hundred pounds between losing to contest prep and then gaining after that cycle. S small side. <laughs> That's insane. How, where, where did you even, how, where, where did you even find the roids? That's my question. Oh, dude, I, I lived on Long Island. I lived on oh, everybody Island, has. You, bro. All, all you got to do is find the homie in the gym that looks like he's on gear and he is, and he is, and he's either got, he's either got the stuff or he knows where to get the stuff. And, um, you know, long story short, I actually got a bad batch. By the time I ended my cycle, there was uh, a few CCs left in one of the vials. And I'm like, wait a sec, like that shouldn't have been there. You know, yeah. so it's probably some like bathtub, you know, underground, not garbage, yeah. you know, test. It was, it was test, um, enanthate. So it was just testosterone. It wasn't like any of the, the crazy androgens or anything like that. Um, 
but it worked but i got i got i just blew up like yeah. bloated water weight gained some fat but obviously i was i think i was like incline pressing 140 pound dumbbells for like eight reps it, it was just ridiculous what that stuff does and uh, i mean out of all the drugs i've done which god willingly i'm sober now um testosterone is hands down the most psychologically active substance you could take yeah um as, as a you, side note did you experience like the you know all the personality things that they always talk about uh i was suited for that i, I was a angry 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 kid yeah. um and a, a lot of that was taken out on myself in the gym yeah. uh, as a bodybuilder like bodybuilding for me was certainly more of a a hole in my life that I was trying to fill uh, yep. a sense of a, a lack, a sense of lack of, of myself that I, I, I put that yeah. body armor on. And yeah. I think a lot of bodybuilders can relate to that. And I think as we all mature, um, either injury stops us or, you know, some people wind up having organ failure or other things that kind of God takes us and, and yeah. rings us out and says, Hey, yeah. Hey, like, look what you're doing here, guy. Um, and so, uh, to, to get back to the arc of my journey with the next part will go much faster. Um, I left the gym at the end of that cycle and I didn't post cycle properly. And so I had about a year and a half of just an emotional and physiological wreck inside of me because my body was trying to kind of get back to producing testosterone yeah. naturally, which thank God I only did one cycle. It was three months. So at 19, like my body was still really vigorous. So I, yeah. I feel that I didn't mess myself up permanently, but still definitely, you know, stunted where I could potentially be now had I not done it. So I never suggest anyone to do those substances yeah. um, unless you are literally trying to be an IFBB pro. Yeah. There's no other reason to take, to take steroids, but um, I left the gym in, in so much pain. I'm like, what, what am I doing to myself? And, um, uh, you know, I just reached out to God. I prayed to God and I was like, I need help. So, something's got to change. And, you know, I, I wound up getting into a lot of partying and, and drugs. And, and, uh, I went on a couple year journey of trying to be a techno DJ and a music producer. Um, cause that was kind of the party scene that I fell into was the New York city underground nightclub scene, which is huge and, and has been a part of my, a big part of my life, my journey. And, um, you know, I can't say I regret anything, but had I had hindsight, obviously I'd, I'd do things different, but yeah, I can't, that's, 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 that's not, not the way time, time works, you know? <laughs> so uh, a few years of not really training consistently, I wound up, um, you know, maybe dropping down to like 150 pounds, but so jaded about bodybuilding, like so anti-training, anti-conventional lifting, um, that eventually led me to yoga which I did a teacher training, like a 30 day ashram style immersion, shut my phone off. Um, you know, really just dove deep into that. At that time I was also vegan, which was complete brainwash indoctrination nonsense. Um, so between not training, doing just yoga and being vegan and also like smoking a ton of marijuana, I, w I became like the complete polar opposite of that insane, aggressive, hyper masculine bodybuilder. Yeah. I was this like weak, effeminate, emotional mess. Yeah. <laughs> and so um, that led me to going into Hawaii for a little bit less than a year. I lived on Hawaii and um, came back to Long Island shell shocked from the culture. And then, uh, you know, long story short, I met my fiance, we fell in love, we got pregnant, uh, on Long Island. Well, she got pregnant. I got her pregnant. <laughs> and then we, uh, we, we road tripped out to Arizona, lived there for a few years. And that was really where I started rebuilding my foundation. I think having my son was hands down the biggest life changer for me of, of being able to look at myself a little bit more clearer and see what I've done in the past, where I want to see myself as he develops and gets older to be the man that I want to be for my child. And, uh, that's slowly brought me back to training because I realized, okay, I'm like this effeminate mess. And that's not going to raise a strong boy. 
No. And so I needed to clean, clean my act up. So, you know, over the past few years, I, I eventually got sober. I ditched, um, all the psychedelics, uh, marijuana has been a few, few years now. And that allowed me to clear my head enough to then realize like, wow, I need to get strong. Like I, I want to be strong, but I don't want to do what I did in the past, which felt so restrictive and, and, and tight and, and, you know, um, rigid, like the bodybuilding oh. stuff. And so I eventually stumbled upon things like functional patterns and a lot of other quote unquote functional methodologies, which got my body moving in a more biomechanically sound way, which started helping with some of the old injuries and I was feeling better. But I, I realized none of these guys are really strong. Yeah. Um, like you, like I'm like, okay, I could do really cool stuff with a kettlebell, but it's a nine kilogram kettlebell. Like, yeah, what's you're the point not strong. Here? Yeah. So that um, brought me to eventually find the rope and the rope is truly what rebuilt my foundation physically, mentally, and, and uh, really brought me to a place where I could then add muscle and strength back onto my body in a way that's not restrictive. And so I found that through Tim Sheaf, um, which I had been following him just from his like, uh, he, he had that whole vegan brand and then he dropped that and was getting so much hate online. So he was going on like a big podcast spree. Um, and so I was like, Oh wow. Like I was just vegan. And now I realized that stuff's retarded. So he he happened to be one of those guys that I was finding information on, uh, that led me to David Weck's work, of course. And so I bought my first rope in, uh, early 2020, which wound up being the perfect time because yeah. of the nonsense that wound up happening that year and all the gym closures and everything. And so, um, over the past three years now, I have mastered rope flow and still on the, in the process, there are some people out there way more skilled than me, but I find, um, I'm best able to use it as a practical tool for strength training, not just like a skill um, with the rope itself. Yeah. And so, um, having started really mastering the rope toward the end of 2020. And then, uh, David actually invited me out to San Diego. And so I spent a few days with David and at the WEC method lab. And I I got to train with Chris Chamberlain and Alex Canellis with the landmine university system. And then I went back out there a few months later and got certified as a landmine university coach. Um, and so David kind of just took me under his wing in a sense and, um, showed me a lot, taught me a lot. And when you hang out with a guy like him or anyone who's really deep into a craft after a few days, you, you, you just like absorb stuff from them, like osmotically in a sense, just by being around them, you know? And so I'm fortunate to call him a mentor and a friend. And, uh, I really have taken his principles of WEC method and applied them in my own way for my own goals, which is still very conventionally oriented. Like for me, there's nothing, there's nothing like a pump. There's nothing like feeling big in my body, but I don't want it to be restrictive to the rest of my life. And so through the use of rope flow as a tool and the WEC method principles, in the context of training with weights, I've developed my own system, which is ET strength, which is basically all about moving well, feeling good, and then getting strong. So those are kind of the the three principles. And then, you know, along the way, tons of nutrition, deep dives and research that I've done. And, uh, yeah, I guess that's about as, uh, in depth as I can get to the short story. No, that, well, that's why I would say like, that. no, we, the, the conversation takes us where the conversation takes us. There's, there's a lot, there's a lot of good stuff that are really interesting stuff in there that, uh, pops out at me, but we'll, so we'll, we'll just go with the first thing that kind of stood out to me was, um, so you said, um, by the way, so how, how old are you? I'm 29. Okay, so we're we're pretty close. I was like, if you if you remember Greg Plitt and the early YouTube days, then we got to be per- fairly close. Because I've asked uh, some of the younger guys recently that I've spoken to about you know if they remember Greg Plitt, and they're like, no, I don't remember who that is. Uh, I was like, damn man, okay, that that guy. Um, 
But you said that uh, so you use the rope to uh, enhance and like your your strength training. So I the way that I've uh, in my short, quick background, I grew up playing basketball. I love basketball, forced myself to uh, be able to dunk uh, at the expense of my uh, health. Uh, basically I was too weak, uh, and I did not have the frame that could absorb all the force that I was generating. And so, yeah, I got myself to dunk, but then I had back pain where I couldn't even walk sometimes and no one knew what to do, why I was there. Long story short, it's cause I was too weak. Uh, and as soon as I started lifting, I never lifted in my life, um, as soon as I started lifting, which was ironically after my last year of basketball in college, back pain went away within within like 30 days, back pain gone. And um, so over the years, and that was like back in 2008, um, it was just a steady, uh, I, I'm, I'm very much of the type of thinking of like, I don't care about teams or camps or methodologies I take what is useful and leave what's not and uh I don't remember what year probably like 2016 I came across David's work and so I I had I had ropes and stuff in the gym whenever I found out about I started looking at David's stuff and um I want to know what you think. It, my perspective is this. Um, the better your body moves, the more you can actually, you're, the more your nervous system will allow you to contract when you go to lift. Thus, if I can create more tension because I'm moving better, because my nervous system feels safer, I can have more volume, more tension over time, and thus I'm going to look better. That's kind of my very, very oversimplified perspective on that. But you, you, since you mentioned that, like, what is what is kind of your perspective or insights on that, and how does that work? Yeah, I I completely agree with you. And what comes to mind for me is, and this is something that I'll talk to clients or just people in the gym about, and it's the idea that strength training does not make you a good mover. Yep. And and it will ne it never will. It will make yep. you good at what you do and it's because our nervous system is literally just adapting those motor circuits to utilize otherwise. So the more stress we do something under, if I'm deadlifting 500 pounds once a week and and then I go fall, my nervous system is going to resort to freezing. Because that's what it does when it's under tension and under stress. And so all these bilateral stationary movements are incredible for strength and size, but you can never become a good mover by doing them. Like just look at how a power lifter walks. Look at how a bodybuilder walks. They're, they're clunking around. Not to say that it, it becomes impossible for them to do those things. It's just, it's not going to make them any better at moving. Yeah. And so the rope is the best foundation for movement in my personal opinion. And that's a very biased opinion, of course. Um, it's a, it's the thing that got me moving in a way that I was like, okay, I, I no longer have to worry about hurting my shoulder in an overhead press or dislocating my shoulder or, or worrying about my knee giving out or, or whatever it might have been that would have held me back from training heavy in the past. It built the foundation of movement. It built my nervous system's like re-inhabitation of my whole body in a way that respects locomotion. And then from there, if your body can locomote well, th which is our fundamental purpose, right? Like yeah. we don't have to teach a kid how to walk. Their body right. physiologically step-by-step step, gets them to walk. And if we could master that and be good at that and all of the aspects of that, so running, throwing, um, all the basic human movements, of course, but locomotion being the base principle, which requires rotation to do it functionally, then whatever strength we add on top of that is only going to be more functional. And so, you know, personally for me over the past three years, I've been doing so much conventional training and so much rope, and I've noticed zero things 
that would typically come from three years of conventional training. And so I find it to be basically the antidote to the bodybuilding culture um, for anyone who's got shoulder pain, elbow pain, hip pain, knee pain. Like I look at these guys, I'm like, okay, you can, sure. Like I remember shoulder pressing hundred pound dumbbells and how much my shoulder felt like shit after that. Like, don't you not want to feel that? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, dude, and, and it's, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. You, you, you go. I, I was just going to say, I, you know, one of my early influences was reading, um, you know, the books by Dan, John and Pavel. And it's like, you should feel better and more capable at the end of your training session, not worse. And that was one of the big light bulb moments for me because I came like when I got into lifting and all this, it was the early CrossFit days and we were just hammering the shit out of ourselves, like insane. Um, and I was just like, by the end of the week, I'd be like falling apart. And I'm like, there's gotta be a better way, you know? <laughs> Like you, that's that's not the outcome we're looking for, but that's that's kind of just what we not necessarily brainwash, but we just accept it as that's how it is, you know. Yeah, I think there's a lot of allure to the idea of training yourself as hard as possible to achieve a particular result, even if it's at the expense of a lot of things. Yeah. Um, I think it's very short sighted. And it's very uh, pride driven and it's useful. I think that's something we all go through. I don't think it's something we shouldn't do at all. Um, because in reality, if you want to be great at anything, there is going to be a cost. And, yeah. and that's where I'm not black and white with anything. If someone's goal is to be a power lifter and have a 1500 pound, like walk away competition weight where you're benching five, or, or you're benching four, squatting six and, you know, uh, deadlifting five or whatever, you know, if whatever you want that to be, then functional to you is powerlifting training. Yeah. Like don't do functional patterns. Yeah. Um, and so I think fitness is very nuanced and goal driven, but we're talking about a fraction of the population there. A fraction. And, of and fraction. so like, yeah, like minuscule amounts of people actually have that desire and yet the person that looks into our industry sees that and assumes that's what box they have to fit into. Yeah. And that's the problem with the fitness industry, in, in my opinion, is that there's not enough entry level things for people to bite onto and figure out what's best for them coming from the most popular things. Yeah. And so um, to, to speak to the CrossFit point, I happened to meet a master's champion, a master's like age division champion of uh, the CrossFit games or, or a second, third place, or I, I can't remember exactly, but, um, and it was, she was a woman and she was in tears to me describing the result of the pursuit of that goal. Um, with, I mean, I'm getting chills right now. I remember the conversation, just, uh, the, the amount of pain and inflammation and autoimmune issues and, yeah. and just like the reality of, of leaving that now, you know, not being able to do it physically and having been at that high, high stat, but realizing like, for what, you yeah. know, like for what was all that for? And, well, you, and you why know, why about, did I drive myself to do that? You you talk about that identity thing several times, and that's such a huge thing, dude. For me, it was identity of you know being a basketball player, of being able to dunk, like to then being you know being ripped all year round. Then it was you know having being able to deadlift, you know, five hundred pounds, like all these things that I attached my identity to along the way which is what causes all the problems. Like, uh, and it takes you, I mean, these are conversations that are, you know, because I think you make a really good point about something easy to bite onto and start with um, and, and kind of take all the pressure off uh, because these are probably not the conversations that someone who's kind of struggling at the moment, whatever their struggle is, they're probably not going to have this conversation. They're just going to look for, I need to fix this. 
and there there are not a lot of solutions that are just like take the pressure off and let yourself start moving whatever that is it, everything seems so complicated which is why despite i mean you know all this like despite the amount of money being spent on health and fitness and medicine you walk outside and it's like none of this is working clearly like seven to eight people out of 10 are overweight uh, or obese and the other, you know, one or two are not much better. Like just because you're skinny doesn't mean you feel good, you know? So um, I think that's a great, great point. And I just, the, the, the way that you're breaking down and I knew this was, this is why I was like, I, I we got to, I want to really have this conversation because how you're describing, you know, a very, logical and rational approach to this thing because this is my def I don't, you, you probably haven't seen this but my definition of health is your ability to engage with life on your terms and so which is why i called my i changed my business name from the san jose barbell to the strength method because strength is to me the most important quality um but you got to be able to move well. And to me, that's strength too. Like if if you can deadlift 500 pounds, but then you can't break into a sprint or you can't pick something up or pick your kid up over your head or you get tired playing, you know, you get winded because you can't play with your kid. You can't get on your, you know, all fours and crawl around with it. And I'm like, you're not really strong. You need to be able to have endurance you need to be able to move you need to be able to get on the ground off the ground uh carry things like all of these things that's why i changed it to the strength method because i'm like health is built on strength um and then I, I my definition for that is like even beyond just physical it's like emotional strength spiritual strength financial strength um to, that's what to me that's like the most important quality that allows you to engage with life on your term. So uh, that's, that's beautiful. Um, uh, you know, the, the, when you're talking about transforming your body and stuff, I used to have this, I have, I have this idea of like, if I look at, if you look at animals, which is one of the things that drew me to the rope as well, I'm like animals far stronger, far more flexible, mobile, whatever across the board right like they have all the qualities they're not sitting there training they're not sitting there warming up uh doing mobility they're not doing any of that so why why is a snow leopard i it, snow leopard was always in my mind as like the epitome of power athleticism strength you know mobility all this stuff and i'm like how can this animal be like that and i'm like what does it do it just moves the way the animal is supposed to move so and i think about humans what how am i how are we missing that point because if we do that and that's what like the ropes i'm like that that seems more in line with oh this is how you're supposed to move and you talk about locomotion we used to do tons of crawl work and all kinds of stuff like that but for that reason so um you know, share a little bit more about like, you know, the, that, that idea of like, what is that the ropes actually do? Cause people don't actually, you know, we've been talking for a while, but most people still don't know what the ropes are and like, what is it doing? Why is that working? You know? Yeah. Well, I think to your point about, um, right. Like the big cats not having to stretch or, you know, your dog can be lounging on the couch and then you throw a ball and boom, he's it's off, gone. you know, no, doesn't need to activate his glutes with, with some soft tissue work or, or anything beforehand. Um, and I think what that boils down to is as humans, we have the unique capability to think about thought, right? Like that's what separates us from the animal kingdom. And in that process, we in our culture have lost almost all of regular human movement in our lives. 
like if we were to take our base requirements for a moving body of a human, we walk outside to our car, we drive to our job. For the most part, a lot of people sit at a desk or do a lot of sitting for their work. They come home in that same car. They go sit on their couch. They sit for dinner. So not to say that sitting is the evil, but the idea is that an animal moves like an animal and humans don't move like humans anymore. We, yeah. we move like a 20th of what we're supposed to do a day on average or less, you know, and it's also being propagated by our culture to, to do that. Um, to be sit in front of your couch to consume and consume information and and garbage food and and all that and so I I think you know I used to have this uh, definition of the fitness industry as a a necessary invention to a shit culture. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, <laughs> you know, I mean, like, sure, you had some army guys, you had military throughout all human history, but that was a select group. But the rest of the people were still out in the fields. They're still walking to the stores. They're still doing all the things that require that are required for human movement to then meet just a base level of health, right? Like so many people are not even at the starting line of health. Yeah. They're, they're, they're in such a deep pit because of the culture and because of the way we've been born into it. And also just the severe lack of information or lack of good information and blatant and purposeful and pernicious malinformation about nutrition and lifestyle and health and all these things, right? Like my dad just got back to me and, he, and I'm telling him to get some TRT. Um, and he's like, oh yeah, doctor said my testosterone is normal. And I'm like, well, they've moved the goalposts the past 30 years. So of course yeah, you're fucking normal, normal for what? Yeah. Like according it, it, to, he's, on, he's like, yeah, I'm on the low end of normal. I'm like, okay, that's probably like a 98 year old's fucking testosterone. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and I'm getting heated and a little cuss. So I, I'll, I'll, t I'll chill out a little bit, but, but it just, it gets me so angry, man. It really yeah. gets me so angry at, um, how much uh, physical suffering people go through simply because they just don't have the information or the culture doesn't support it or that there may be their family. Like, like I was born into an unhealthy family and I was the the kid that like pioneered the way toward health. Like yeah. I, like a lot of people um, and I'm, I'm planning to do this as well. Right. Where it's like, you have the, the millionaire kid, like, right. You, you break the kind of poverty mindset. Um, but there's also like, the health right and and the wealth yeah. in the health and you yeah. got to break that cultural or um you know kind of like ancestral line that you've had yeah. you know like i watched my grandpa die with the whole standard american death right the diabetes the dementia the alzheimer's the morbid obesity um the inability to think or speak or do anything but you know blank Eat out at a television yeah. for the last couple of years of his life um and so i think that that also kind of had a big impact on me just seeing how hurt and how uh, sick the the family members around me had become due to uh, what's out there. And so I think if we were to just get back to those roots of eating food, not food like stuff, and just moving more, walking more, like like it's the simplest things are the most underrated in the fitness industry. And it's because they're not sexy. Yeah. And sexy is what sells, right? Like half the reason I don't like marketing or getting a marketing coach is because I see through it's all bullshit. The, the, well, it's not, it's just, I, it, it works. And the reason it works is because it preys on our, our base instincts. Yeah. And so, you know, to make something not sexy, look sexy is hard. Um, and that's what I hope to intend to do, um, with, with health and, and fitness and, and everything like that. But, um, you know, nonetheless, when it comes to the rope and, and how it works, uh, the post that I made yesterday, I think kind of sums it all up where our spines don't move how they're supposed to, uh, in the general population. Um, look, look at anyone walk through a grocery store. Yeah, no. their their spines are stuck, and whether that's I'm not talking like forward head position, I'm not talking scoliosis, I'm talking about the just the sheer basic fact that people's spines don't move when they walk anymore. Like that's yeah, just what it is at all. And 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 your spine is not only the 
the the mid part of your body that literally every limb and every movement stems from but it's also a power generator right so that's that's david's idea right the spinal engine is is i mean it might not be his exact idea right but it's like that's a lot of what his system yeah. is based on um and so just that simple ability to have a feedback net mechanism which is the rope where every single rep that you do is inherently rotating your spine to one degree or another based on where you are or how braced you are or how coordinated you are. The constant practice of that is only going to get your spine to move more, which is only going to improve. And by only, I mean, it's like the, that's the only thing that can happen is yeah. your movement improves because your I, spine moves. Dude, I, I, I don't know how I completely missed that. Like the rope is actually is giving you feedback. Like if <laughs> on what's happening here, like I just, I just realized that right now, like, you know, what, why it's, and now it, that makes even more sense why it's so powerful. Uh, and, and that if you think about important. it this way, yeah, feedback is the only thing that's going to allow us to create a strong enough stimulus to then adapt to it, right? Yeah. And the quality of the feedback is important too, which uh, is a large part to do with our senses and our sensory input. And so the rope, not only is it a, a physical feedback, right? Like I tangibly feel my muscles moving and my body moving, but more subtle to that and potentially even more importantly than that is I have an object that is constantly passing peripheral field, peripheral field, one periphery, next periphery, the cross periphery, right? And I'm either, and I'm not staring at the rope. It's moving too much. I yeah. can't. So I have to relax my eyes, right? So our eyes are so fucking pin focused in the bottom quadrant because of our phones and our lifestyle that if your sensory input is poor, your motor output is shit. Yeah, or or at least not nearly maximized. Let me ask you on that point, um, because to me that makes perfect sense, and like I I see it, I I read about it. How do you and I understand how valuable, and like when that when you get that, you can experience it, and instantly things begin to click. How do you explain that to? the people who aren't as like, you know, they're not nerding out about this the way that, you know, you and I would, but I know how much value somebody is going to get when they just start throwing that rope around and, and then these things are happening and they're starting, their eyes are starting to relax and the sensory input is, is, you know, they're give they're starting to flood those nerves with inputs for the first time in, their entire life and uh, maybe except when they were a baby crawling, you know, like, how do you explain that to them or, or get, start I, typically to like... let it... I understand what you're saying. I, I know exactly where you come from with that uh, question. And I let it be an after the fact explanation to a question or an experience this is not something i would go into with someone's first rope flow session it's too heady like it doesn't yep. matter what matters is you swing the rope and you're you no it. matter what like you're getting that peripheral stimulation your eyes are naturally going to relax and that and you're going to get the benefit from it if you want to freak someone out in a good way, like as, as a way to kind of drill this home for them or to drill the idea of how important your sensory input is to your motor output. If you have someone who has a hard time touching their toes, for example, or reaching over their head, there's a handful of movements that you could do simply with the eyes that will get them 20, 30, 40% more range or 20, 30, 40% less pain. And you, and you might know this. So if someone has a hard time touching their toes and you have them look at their thumb and bring it in and out and in and out and in and out, not that fast, but slowly for 60 seconds, 90 seconds, and then retest their toe touch, they're going to come up from that toe touch and look at you like you have <laughs> yeah. 10 heads yeah. because now they can touch their toes yeah. or their the back of their knees don't hurt or whatever it is. And it's like, well, your eyes didn't like the ground coming at you. And they're like, what? Like, really? 
And it's yeah. like, well, you've looked at a screen for the past 20 years at your desk job or, or maybe, you know, whatever the circumstance might be, maybe you had a trauma where something came in at you fast and now your brain is traumatized to incoming objects. Right. And so, you know, not only do we have our visual field, but then we also have our auditory, which the rope stimulates with the little whirring sound that it comes. So you get this constant multidimensional input to your senses that is mind bogglingly effective and, and game changing for so many people. Um, and, and it simply takes enough time to experience it. It's, it's not that you will or you won't, or certain people do, or certain people don't. It's, it's simply take three months, take 15 to 30 minutes a day with the rope, just do a figure eight, like, just, like, don't worry about anything yeah. else. If you only want the benefits, like if you want to get more skilled, learn more patterns, learn how to sequence, learn how to change direction. And of course, that's only going to stimulate all that stuff more. But if you're talking to like a general population type person, just wants to move better, wants to get out of pain, wants to be able to sit off the couch a little bit more effectively, like whatever it is, just you need a rope. Yeah. <laughs> and you don't even have to jump through it. And you don't even have to jump through it. <laughs> People are always like, wait, so I'm not going to jump over it. I'm like, no, 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 we're not going to jump over it. But I, I was smiling because... I, I, you know, and I don't know if you, um, and I, I won't come back to this question because now that you mentioned that the toe touch test, but anytime I've, you know, implemented something like that and people are like, holy shit, like they just added a foot to their range of motion. Um, it's, it's always hilarious. But so you mentioned, you mentioned that. And one of the things that helped me, so I had the back pain and then I, from doing too much and not having, you know, uh, uh, an understanding of, you know, when to push, when to back, like, I, you know, when you're immature, you're just trying to, it's like that PR thing, you know, like, uh, always just trying to do more. Um, I had this abdominal strain and then I couldn't, I couldn't even like cough or laugh without like pain. And I, I couldn't lift for like nine months. But I was introduced to David Delanave, um, who I then invited to come do a workshop at my gym. Um, and he introduced me to this thing called he he calls it biofeedback, but the 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 program was gym movement. I don't know if you heard of those guys. Um, Frankie Fairs, uh, David Delanave, there's somebody else too, but Long story short, so we would, so I started biofeedback testing, toe touch, using the toe touch, testing everything. And I, I would use that to guide my training. Like, okay, what, what should I do today? I would do a few reps, test it. If it's, if it tests well, cool, do it. If not, then don't do it. That really helped me become more in tune with listening to my body. Everyone talks about listening to their body, but they don't they don't understand the language, you know? Uh, and so are you, have you used that? Uh, are you familiar with that stuff as well? I, I'm personally not familiar with that. No. Um, but I do think to your point of a, a miscommunication of the language that one experiences in their body, it, um, I think for a lot of people simply, the, the language of interoception, right? right? Being able to feel inside your body, where the tension's coming from. Does this food make me bloated? Uh, all the things, how emotional am I, right? Like all the things that come with interoception. Um, training and simply your depth of time in training with the intent, correct, will get you there. A lot of people have such an externally driven desire for training that they're not in their bodies. You know, something I, I remember and, and think about now, and I, I made a, gosh, I made a meme about it probably like three years ago or something is about how, when you like the average buff dude at the gym, the average aesthetics boy or Sarm goblin, right? The young, the young guys, right? They're so far out of their body when they're training because they're in the mirror 
all they're doing is watching themselves in an externally reflected vision and they're adjusting their movements to what they see in the mirror they're not actually feeling inside, inside of them yeah. and that's why they're you know you see what i'm saying like the yeah, 100% and that's where the the clarity the clarity of the intent for me my my whole purpose in the gym is to feel that's it i go to the gym to experience my body I don't go for a particular physique. I don't go for a particular outcome of, of volume or weight. I go to feel my body. And I think if enough people started distinguishing that external from internal intent as to why they're going to the gym, a lot of the stuff that happens to us by getting punched in the face with an injury or a setback would be naturally minimized simply because of the goal of the session is to experience your body. And if you're experiencing pain, maybe back off a couple pounds or back off a, a certain amount of the range of motion. But if you have this external desire, like, okay, I need to complete five sets. I need to complete 10 reps. I need to linearly overload from last week. And all I care about is what this weight looks like as I'm benching it off my chest in the mirror where I'm looking down like this at the mirror and I'm like, am I even, or my hands crooked? Yeah. It's like, dude, you're not even in your body. Like, why are you in the gym? And then of course, that's a very shallow outcome. It's a very yeah. shallow experience. Dude, that, this is, this is like such, but you know, this, I was going to say this is such gold and, and you can tell you know, earlier you said, uh, obviously you're biased and I'm like, yeah, but you know what? Your bias is legitimized because it's based in experience across the board. You're not just, you didn't just do bodybuilding and then decide X, Y, Z. You didn't just do the yoga boy stuff or the yoga people stuff and then decide this is it. Like you've gone across the board and and again it's that thing is like let me take what is useful and leave what's not and that's that's it like you know guess what moving well is very important bodybuilders don't like the most intelligent ones do but that gets lost in all of the bullshit um and getting strong is really good but you know the you you miss you miss all these nuances unless you've been inside your body and you've opened with an open mind experienced all these things so you know your bias is and it, it reminds me so much of my own personal experience in in many different ways but um man like i sometimes i'm like as you're saying stuff i'm like oh that makes sense that makes sense that makes sense and uh it's that's why again like i said wisdom comes from multiple perspectives that's why i'm like as you're saying stuff my my understanding is deepening as we're having this conversation so that's that's super dope um let me ask you i know we're i know what i don't know what your schedule is like but uh i'm cruising man cool I'm cruising. um i did want to ask you transitioning a little bit and we're definitely going to have to, you know, talk some more, dude, because this is this is the stuff like, you know, I, I love Chris's stuff because. Not only can he move so well, but he's fucking strong as shit, like absurd. No one can talk shit to that guy. No, no one can talk shit about Chris Chamberlain. <laughs> you, just, you just can't. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like. Jesus Christ, like it's nuts. He, he, he is he is the most hardworking, humble, intelligent individual that I have ever been blessed to be near and learn from and speak to in the fitness industry, period. Like you he doesn't have to speak. Like like oh. you just watch him and it speaks speaks for itself. Yeah. And and true truly a a lifelong learner. And uh, and a a uh, a next level teacher because of that, and uh, yeah, I mean he he had his start in a lot of the the gymnastics uh, type and calisthenics type stuff, um, from what I understand, which then moved him to kettlebells, which then moved him through like the feats of strength, 
And uh, I'll share a quick story, um, both my personal one and, and his kind of realization as the potency to WEC method and the coiling core in particular. Um, so his story was like, he came to David and he couldn't hit a, a snatch or something at a certain weight that he really wanted to. And David's like, try this. And I think he primed his coiling core and he used a coiling action as he did the snatch and he hit the weight like clean yeah. effortlessly. And he kind of, he's like, okay, bit down on it. For me, uh, my first session ever with the rope, first session ever, this is why I so dang nerded out on it. I did a cold set of pull-ups, eight, 10 reps, whatever it was. To preface that, the left side of my body is where every single one of my injuries has been. I've never had an injury to the right side of my body in terms of soft tissue, always left side. So I always had a hard time really feeling connected bilaterally, which of course, of course, bodybuilding was a shit show for me. Yeah. Did my set of pull-ups, rolled the rope first time ever. Cause I, when I, when I go into something brand new, I go in as unbiased as possible and as objective as possible. So I said, okay, I'm going to slowly integrate this. I'm going to use it in between my sets. That's how I'm going to get my reps in with the rope. I watched a overhand race and chase video on YouTube on my way to the gym. I'm like, okay, figure eight, thumb leads. Got it. Good. Pick up the rope for the first time after that cold set of pull-ups, 90 seconds, roll the rope, 90 seconds, sloppy, clunky, robotic, whatever. Hop back on the pull-up bar. Not only did I do more reps, but it was effortless. And most importantly to me, connected equally to both sides for the first time in my life. Like I, I got off that pull-up bar and I looked at this rope like yeah, it was really magic like, or something. Yeah. <laughs> I was like 90 seconds and the left side of my body feels the same yeah. as my right after 15 years of never once experiencing that in a bilateral movement. Yeah. And so that, you know, again, it's like between the brain, the core, the coiling, the rotation, the input sensories, or I'm sorry, the sensory input benefits you get from it, all that kind of accumulates. But, um, so that was, that was it for me with the rope where I was like, wow, more reps, less effort, more integrated, more connected, 90 seconds of work. Sign me up. Yeah. I'm in. That's all Sign I need me to up. see. Yeah. And so like, there's one of the things that I, you know, practicality is so important to me, especially if we're looking at, Hey, what things can I actually do that I'm going to do that don't require, I need this setup. I need that. I need like, no, you just need a rope. You throw it in your bag. Like you don't need anything. <laughs> like you have space for a rope, you know? Uh, so I love, I love that component of it as well. Now I'm getting, fi man, I'm getting fired up. I'm like, I have, I've been, um, uh, we have, we still have, uh, uh, ropes at the gym, but I haven't been on them as much as I used to when we had a ton of people in there, but, uh, like I gotta get back on the ropes, man. I gotta get back on the ropes. Um, but my, the, the question that I wanted to, the, the, a little bit of a transition, you said you guys you guys have a bunch of land now out there. You guys are you guys have enough, animals and stuff. Not a bunch. But yeah, yeah. I mean, we have our little homestead. It's how, uh, how just a few acres. Um, our goal our goal was our goal was not production. It was just self sustainability, and um, it's going great. I mean, it's a complete lifestyle shift. There's a lot of um, stress in, in a lot of ways that come from it, animals getting sick or, you know, uh, we have our dairy cow. And so my fiance has to be married to the routine of milking her, which, um, can be stressful and, you it's know, daily thing, sometimes right? she kicks, sometimes she doesn't want to be milked. Yeah. I mean, it's every day, twice a day with, the, with the milking and she does all that. Um, so, I mean, you know, she, she kind of handles for the most part, a lot of the animals. Um, and then I do, you know, all the building, all the stuff that needs to be, I fund it all. And then, um, you know, at the same time, you like our, the baby calf came down with a fever. And so I was doing the intramuscular injections, which of course I was familiar with from shooting my own quadriceps with steroids, <laughs> you know, see everything works um, out. Everything you know, so works out. <laughs> 
exactly exactly so uh so yeah there's um you know for us all you need to do is look around and, and realize that city living is uh, frightening yeah. in in a multitude of ways yeah. um particularly the past few years particularly the past few years and so you know we were living pretty rurally in arizona before we got this house but um it's hard to do things in Arizona, you know, water's scarce land is, um, cheap, but you're in the middle of nowhere. So it's not even really worth it. Like middle of nowhere. It's a huge state, so much land. Um, and we didn't want to do that. So we knew, I mean, this pocket of the States, you know, Southeast it's, it's where the country started. And for a reason, yeah. you know, there's so much, uh, there's so much down here. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so that, that's been our recent endeavor, you know, and for me, I, I drink a ton of milk in general, um, raw milk is actually, I, I would say, so long as it's not, um, a one milk, do you know the difference between, um, the, no, the genes in the proteins and patients and stuff now? So, so you have heirloom breeds of cows and you have, in a sense, like how a, a plant can be genetically, um, you know, kind of narrowed down to produce in a certain way. You also have that with the breeding of animals. So for the most part, you have at all dairy dispensaries, you have Holstein cows. The, the breed is Holstein. They could produce like 10 gallons of milk a day, yes. but the casein protein that's in there, the gene expression of it is called A1. And it's far harder for humans to digest and it's typically inflammatory to people and so on top of that you have it pasteurized and homogenized so no wonder why people have a hard time with dairy and so there's only 13 states where raw milk is legal i think you can get it in california I, I think and it, ideally it you want to get a2 a while. Milk. yeah i'm not i'm not too sure um, but you want to get a2 milk which are the heirloom breeds the natural breeds so it's much easier for you to digest and if it's raw you're going to have all those enzymes and you're going to have everything in there that helps digest the milk on top of that and so um you know having our own milk is um milk is a superfood it's it is insane and it it's one of the foods in my opinion if anyone is getting over veganism find yourself some raw milk some raw dairy it is going to bring you back to life and uh, a main part of it is the vitamin a content in the form of retinol which you i don't care how much beta carotene you get you are deficient in vitamin a because your body cannot convert that to retinol and if it does it's highly stressful and if you can and genetically do it like if you come from you know a more um a tropical climate right like your genes and you might be able to get away with more plant-based stuff but nonetheless like milk and raw dairy is a a godsend and a superfood and and something that literally cures vegans depression okay. weight gain um you know just recomp recomposing their body muscularly um because of all the proteins and and yeah. everything in there it's uh it's a game like you can live on milk you know, you can no, live on milk. I mean, eggs. I believe it. Our, our, so my family's from Punjab in India. Um, and I was actually born there as well. And the way that my, oh, wow. Parents, yeah. And my parents, with the way that they grew up, both of them, my, my dad came here when he was 19 and my mom came here when she was 20. So they grew up on the tail end of this type of living. And for sure, my grandparents. They drank milk every day, butter made with, you know, real milk, all these things. It's so crazy to see within literally a generation or two, the cycle going full circle. Because from, you know, the last 50 years or so, the culture has completely changed to it's totally no one even bats an eye. Everyone complains about it, but the diabetes, the blood pressure, the cholesterol, all of these like problems, they're just normal. We just take the drugs and then blah, blah, blah. And everyone complains about it, but they forget that they are. Are you talking? 
are you talking like in your culture back in, in India or are you talking like the westernized experience well, of your culture? Well, well, both, because now even there, it's it's the same as here. It's people are eating just crap. They're overweight. They don't move. Um, so it's not much different than here um, because the people here, you can't even say we have more access to information now because the Internet, you know. Um, but it's just so interesting because they are they grew up with the answers and now we're shifting back to that but the, it's just like not it doesn't doesn't compute like everyone is still just i need to go to the doctor this and that and like i'm like i'm i'm like you also in the regard of like i was the first person who you know was got healthy or got strong or you know got lean or anything like that no that wasn't a conversation in in our families it just wasn't um but that's super interesting i'm gonna have to i'm gonna have to look into that as well because we we have some land out here as well uh we're fortunate to have a good little piece of land in in san jose um and uh we're in the middle of remodeling but we got a bunch i have a whole area that you know um we have neighbors with cows and things so like that's that's our plan as well to to start having some animals and you know take i'm all about observation i'm like if you without bias observe you're gonna come across the right answers or or answers that are more useful um and that's all you gotta you just observe and and keep an open mind and they present themselves to you um yeah, and how you observe something often is more important than what you're actually observing, because that that gives us the ability to get that insight and th actually think about things. Like, you know, you're not just consuming something at face value; you're actually able to process it. Th that that's a very important point. Can do you mind expanding on that? Yeah, I mean, self awareness is um, it's it's of course a popular thing. You know, it's in the pop culture. It's it's out there, but. Uh, a lot of people still like go to Barnes and Nobles to get a self-awareness book, right? You know, you see what I'm saying? <laughs> it's like, you're still reaching outside there, guy. Um, and so uh, <laughs> I, I think, I think we've, uh, as a culture, you know, through, through school indoctrination, through um, media, through movies, through music, we have, uh, we've been so, so dumbed down for how we are able to comprehend what's in front of us, right? Like every so much of it is just toxic that most people think in a way that allows them to consume the world and not see the reality of the toxicity. And it's a natural mechanism for us of self-preservation, right? Like you get used to these things and, and you no longer think so clearly about it because it's become normalized. Yeah. And, uh, you know, self-awareness is only as useful as the clarity that you have about your ideals, I think, where, uh, being in observation, you can so easily slip into pride. You can so easily slip into lust. You can so easily slip into um, all the things that our flesh loves and and loves to gloat to, right? Um, looking at someone and immediately going into some form of comparative judgment or uh, a way to look down on someone, right? Because maybe they're fat or obese or or they don't move well, right? It's like you, you have people in the fitness community in in general where it's like, I'll use, are you familiar with Gota? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, they'll look at your ankle and they'll dismiss you as a human being. You know, like the extremes that people go to with their ideologies um, will will taint their observations yeah. so much and so having that having a clear slate is hard you know because we're all 
opinionated. We're all biased to one degree or another. And to say we're not is a, a lie. And so anyone who does is a liar, um, you know, in, in any regard. But that's the challenge because that's our natural fleshly thing is, is hierarchical. It's, it's outside of us. And so that's where our spirit and our soul really come in to, to play the conscience. And, and a lot of our conscience is tainted as well. So it's like, you know, listening to your body, right? It's like if, you're, if your mind is off, the signals you get from your body and that translation to it is not going to be correct right so you can't always rely on yourself either and uh it's it's challenging man it's really hard but i think anyone with with honest honest intent is going to find find things you know 100 percent. well you know and and maybe we'll we'll wrap up on this um but th- this is one of the reasons and i and i you know, I'm, I got the sense of it from looking at your page and kind of listening to you, but you're a pretty, you're a spiritual person. Um, yeah, I- I've had a, a really interesting arc. Um, I'm, I'm an Orthodox Christian now, and uh, I've been all sorts of things in the past. That's for sure. Yeah. But uh, again, you know, I think we all have a choice each day to engage in a spiritual journey. And a lot of people don't even think it's a thing. You know, a lot of people don't even know that you can engage in the world spiritually. And there's a lot of misconceptions. There's lots of half truths, some truths. And I, I don't think anyone can ever come to the truth without their own personal journey to it. Yeah. You know, so, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm highly spiritual, but in terms of my orientation to spirituality is Orthodox Christianity. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Here's the thing, man, like, and I, I've been hearing this so much and I, and I used to do this a little bit as well of like, I need to qualify, uh, you know, I need to qualify this and not be, oh, I don't want to sound religious or spiritual or, you know, whatever. And more and more what I've come to kind of you know, I, I'll say this to people too, is like, I was like, don't qualify. Like w- one of the things that's missing, and this is why faith and religion was important. You could say, oh, you know, religion does this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's people. The The real message and the truth comes from the people who were first sharing that message, whether it's, you know, Christianity, whether it's uh, uh, my religion, Sikhism, Guru Nanak, you know, all these people, that's the message. It's not what, you know, other people did after, like, that's all irrelevant. When you get down to the message, you know, one of the, and this is why I'm like, it starts with this. I I talk about this all the time, whether, you know, with my one-on-one clients, in my groups, on my social media, whatever. It's like starting with compassion and no judgment is so important because it clears, it clears the lens. It clears the mechanism. And that's the only way to actually see things truthfully. All right. And then to be able to be helpful to yourself. Um, and I think, you know, when, when, when fitness people do that kind of stuff, I mean, like, I, you know, that's, I'm similar to you as well as like with the marketing stuff, like I've studied everything I've been around. I've, I, you know, I know all this stuff, but I'm like, I can't say, I can't do this. I can't do it in that way. I got to find a way that is, that is better. Like I, I just can't use these tools in those ways um because i know how we can get a reaction we can get attention and you know when these fitness people you know talk shit about other fitness people or other methods i'm like that's totally unnecessary and unhelpful um and so you know maybe maybe that's a good good place to end this conversation is just some of your thoughts and maybe your message on like, you know, 
this part of the the journey um because all this stuff the body the 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 stuff it's whatever what what you experience it inside of your being which is you know eternal that's something that's that's the real truth and uh people who are too in the world living in the world with the worldly things they pass it off as like oh whatever blah blah blah. but that's okay like we're not here to convince anybody but for the person that is at that point and they're starting to see it that could be that could be the game-changing message for them you know so i'll let you kind of end on that note um whatever you know thoughts or message you have on that I think it's important for us um, to remember it's a two-way street in in so many ways um, in terms of the body and the soul. And so regardless of where you're at, for example, if, if someone is hyper-spiritual and they are literally not in their body, you know, I've met lots of, of mystics, right, in, in that kind of context, or someone who's very fleshly and stuck in their desires and worldly and, and maybe doesn't believe in God or doesn't have faith. Um, be, those being like the two ends of the extreme, of course, um, is the desire to get out of what's comfortable. And, and so for example, you know, let's say someone is stuck in the, in the world, as you mentioned, right. Very materialistic um, and whatnot the the goal would be to move toward the other polarity you know and i think so much of us regardless of where we are like i mean at at, at one point in my journey right i would have laughed at myself for considering christianity or i would have made fun of me you know and so um we're all on such subjective paths toward our impending death that we will not escape physically that um, those lofty, more spiritual essences, right, or um, or energies, right, things like compassion, things like love, things like wisdom, things like um, respect, right, these things, um, dignity, right, things that we all deserve and, and are inherent to our existence. Those are the things to chase, you know, and and wherever you land is where you were. Uh, I mean we could get into a very heady conversation of like yeah. predestination versus free will versus, you know, all the other things um, get very theological and philosophical. But I think regardless, you know, in a sense and very loosely saying this, like we all get where we're supposed to go because we have made everything up until that point. And, uh, and every, wherever you're at is the accumulation of where you've been and, and you, you, fortunately always have the capability to choose something different you know no matter where no matter what no matter who how why what what you affiliate with spiritually or physically or whatever it's like you know you have free will and and it's your choice and and that creates individual responsibility which then creates a more healthy society in reality and just a healthier family unit or like friends, like wherever it is, wherever you are, you got kids, you don't single, whatever, like self-responsibility is just, it's, it's essential. And, uh, and I think fitness is the most rudimentary tool that one can utilize to start that journey. And I think that's kind of where it all ties in, I would suppose is, it's, it's so simple and it's so physical and it's so mundane. It's so worldly yet has profound effects mentally, yeah. emotionally, spiritually, and, you know, not to compare where anyone else has been or your day hundred to my day, 10,000 or vice versa of, of whatever we're talking about. But like, just, I mean, I have a hard time accepting that anyone truly does not want to be healthy or fit. I have a really hard time. Believing I would that. agree. You know, like at the root 
like where, who you are, you know, and then wherever that starting point is that journey, no matter where it takes you injuries, steroids for me, drug use for me, like it beautiful, necessary, essential to my life, you know, and it wouldn't have happened had I not done all the dumb shit. Yeah. It's, it's so, it's so subjective, man. So, yeah. so much of life is subject, truly subjective. And yeah. it's, uh, but yeah, get fit, pick up a rope, roll it around, feel your body. We'll, we'll, we'll end it on, on that note, but definitely, um, yeah, pick up a rope. Let, let yourself feel something different. Um, and, um, yeah, let it, let it take you where, wherever it takes you. Um, dude, fantastic. This was super enjoyable and valuable um i always say you know like, i don't even really care if anybody watches it because it's everything is like is for me I'm like <laughs> like i get so much from these conversations so but man i i appreciate you appreciate you uh sharing everything that you've shared and your experience and your and your wisdom and knowledge and uh i i think i, I I would love to have another conversation one of these days, but dude, thank you. Um, any, any other, like I'll, I'll put your Instagram and stuff, but like any other place that you would want to share with people. Yeah. Yeah. I, again, likewise, brother, it was a great time talking with you and expanding on these topics and just speaking our feelings and, and perspectives. It's, and I think it's hilarious how fun it is to just, like, I never met you, never spoke to you before. And it's like deeper topics, better conversation than 98% of the people I physically run into. So I'm always happy to do this, get together with like-minded people and, and chat it out and hash out some important ideas that, you know, hopefully will help anyone, if not just us gleaming yeah. our, our own thoughts and, yeah. and, processing each other's perspective but um yeah i mean my website etstrength.com you know i have my rope flow foundations course which is a step-by-step -step guide to get anyone from complete beginner to absolute mastery no matter where they are in between um so many people who have already started their rope flow journey grab the course and boom catalyzes it um you know some people start brand new get the rope included with it and and start but uh, yeah, that's that's my main body of work. I do have some other ideas that I'll be getting into in the next couple months, but I will withhold those and uh, awesome share them when the time comes. But but Dope. yeah, other than that, thank thank you, brother. I appreciate it. It was a great time. Thank you.